Hello, I'm Senior Programmer Jen Wilson, and welcome to this Foam Independent Presents Q&A for the Netflix short documentary, The Martha Mitchell Effect. Special thanks to our lead sponsor, HIFPA, and our virtual screenings partner, Vision Media. And now please welcome our guests, the directors of The Martha Mitchell Effect, Anne Alverge and co-director Deborah McClutchy. Thank you so much for joining us today. So we have a lot of members of Film Independent that are aspiring filmmakers. And so I'd like to start with a question about um, how each of you started in filmmaking. Um, let's start with Anne. Sure. Um, I started many years ago, it feels like now. <laughs> um, I, uh, I didn't study film as an undergrad, um, but I became more interested in film after I graduated and started making Super 8s, was traveling, and then sort of found my path into documentary film um, editing. Um, and I went to grad school, you know, moved to New York City um, and was a shooter for a while and then just sort of made my way back to editing. And that's where I've sort of been ever since for my day job. Okay, for you, Deborah. Yeah, I studied film in college um, and in the Midwest. And so I worked a little bit with friends making films after college, um, doing all sorts of things, shooting, producing, um, smaller independent type stuff, uh, moved to San Francisco and started working in documentary film in San Francisco and was there for a couple of years before all my friends left and moved to New York. So I followed them and came to New York and uh, started out in documentary television, um, doing like associate producing type things um, and then made my way into distribution for a long time and then wanted to make a film. So then I got back into making films with this one. This is our directorial debut, so. So <clears throat> I personally had never heard of Martha Mitchell until the the Julia Roberts TV series that was on Gaslit. For, for the two of you, how um, did you first learn about Martha and what was it about her that made you want to make a film about her? You want to start, Deborah? I can start either way. Let me start. Um, well, we actually learned about Martha from a podcast, um, and we we thought, how could? Whoa, wait, who is this person? Wait, this is a, someone who was fabulous and hilarious and somehow seminal in the Watergate scandal. Yet we had never, neither of us had ever heard of her. Uh, so we did a little bit of digging and found some amazing videos of her um, and thought, and there hadn't been a documentary and realized also the more that we dug into the tapes, because we sort of like, hey, maybe this is a possibility. We realized that um, that she was actually, she wasn't actually more of an instrumental character in, in the scandal and that she had been lost to history as a result of speaking to power. You know, she was essentially discredited by the Nixon administration, you know, who leveraged perceived mental illness and addiction against her. And hence she was silenced and sort of became a hidden figure in history. And we thought, wow, this is like a perfect time to sort of like exhume her story and then also kind of give, return her agency to her, you know, sort of like try to keep the film as much in her voice as possible uh, to tell, to retell her story for today's audience. Yeah, I would just add to that also, it's a story that's always told through all the president's men. That's what everyone always thinks about when it comes to Watergate. And to have this really vibrant character, female character, who was someone who was sort of instrumental and did play a role at that time, be lost to history, um, felt really unfair in a lot of ways. Um, and it was a story, as Anne said, you know, she was speaking truth to power and um, not many Republicans were doing that in our current political era at the moment. And so she was a really intriguing figure in that sense too, because it kind of, um, it, uh, it resonated for today's political times as well. 
So the, the archival footage that you use in the film, which is terrific and gives us such a great picture of who Martha was in public. Um, was it a very, did you have a very difficult time finding archival for her or were, was there a lot in existence that was easily searchable? Um, there was, yeah, we found a lot through the Nixon library all the Super 8 tapes. <laughs> Ironically. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the Super 8 tapes that illustrate, um, you know, the administration we found at the Nixon Library, and those are really wonderful to have and um, really accessible. Um, they had some interviews with Martha as well that we were able to uncover in their collection, um, which is where we really saw how charismatic she was, intelligentic, and just like a fun character to watch. Um, but we also found materials in, you know, like a Northeast film archive that hadn't been uncovered since they had first been seen back in the 70s. There was a university in Arkansas where I uncovered some material from her. Um, and later on in the process, there was an interview with her from 74, I believe it was, that was sitting in a news journalist's attic. Um, and we somehow came upon him, which I'm totally forgetting exactly how we did, but he had this in his attic and he made it available to us to use as well. So it was really a, you know, a deep digging process, um, in a variety of different archives, not just the Nixon library. What, so what it was it, do you think that started prompting Martha to just start speaking her mind? to the press because for a while she was sort of you know playing the game and sort of towing the party line i mean i feel like she was always really outspoken probably more outspoken than they really wanted her to be but for a while she was saying all the right things what was it do you think that prompted her to say something like the vietnam war stinks out loud to someone like helen thomas well, in that particular instance, she actually had a son from a previous marriage who was fighting in Vietnam at that time. So I think it, I think it was personal for her. And that's, that's, I think, why she started to speak out. And, you know, I think maybe she was also testing the waters a little bit, you know, I mean, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. She had been towing the party line. They had, they loved that, that she would um, draw attention from the press since Nixon's administration was very buttoned up. They never really talked to them. So, so they appreciated that, but then that particular incident was when she really crossed the line. And um, yeah, I think she just continued to, I think she liked the attention. I think she, you know, I think to maybe anticipate what your, your next question is, I think, you know, eventually she, she spoke out during the actual Watergate break-in be because she, she knew something was up. And I think, you know, her, she really wanted to, to speak truth to power. But I also think that there was a selfish side and that she was trying to protect her husband from, um, you know, being basically thrown under the bus and being involved in the scandal. Uh, the movie starts with a, a rather stunning quote from Nixon saying, I'm convinced that if there had been no Martha, there would have been no Watergate. And then later is a quote from Martha saying, Richard Nixon destroyed my marriage. So obviously, no love lost between these two. Um, uh, a, do you think do you think that's true? There wouldn't have been a, a Watergate without uh, Martha. And two, what what was it? Do you think that Nixon thought Martha's contribution to the scandal was? Do you, do you want to? Sure. I think um, Nixon was really scapegoating in that quote. He, you know, they had characterized her as with, you know, this perceived mental illness and that she drank too much and that she was basically a crazy lady. Um, and she, you know, um, all these antics of hers sort of distracted her husband, John Mitchell, and therefore he wasn't up to the task of his job because he had this wife that he always had to pay attention to and take care of. And so that was part of that quote of what Nixon was saying. Um, and there was a sort of love triangle going on between the three of them. And Martha was quite jealous that her husband's attention was always elsewhere, oftentimes with Nixon. Um, so that played into part of 
the whole um yeah the love triangle that happened with them and sort of the whole like drama that ensued so martha says the turning point for her was california um and do you want to talk about what the incident was in california that changed everything for martha sure um so at the time of the watergate break-in june 17th 1972 um martha was in california she was in southern california at a resort hotel she was there with a nixon delegation who were essentially fundraising with the committee to re-elect the president and as soon as her husband heard about the break-in he was called back to washington and he told martha oh you just stay here and relax you sit by the pool you you know you've had a hectic time but that was obviously a red flag for her she knew something was up and essentially the bodyguard kept and the other people kept the press from martha because they didn't want her to get upset or they didn't want her to you know, possibly speak out. So of course, once she did see the newspapers, once she did get wind of what was going on, she asked a lot of questions, called her husband, everyone tried to pacify her. And then eventually she got in touch with Helen Thomas. And Helen Thomas started asking her about the Watergate break-in and she started speaking out. And at that point, the bodyguard, uh, theoretically, this is what we, we have been, our research has shown, um, it has been proven that uh, the bodyguard essentially pulled the telephone card. Sorry, sorry. Let me start over. The secret, the security guard pulled the telephone cord out of the wall and um, and contained Martha, and eventually called a doctor who tranquilized her against her will to keep quiet. Yeah. And I think uh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say. I think that was a really pivotal moment for Martha where she realized that she actually could be in danger, you know, that she, that they would be willing to go to those great lengths to silence her. And I think that really terrified her and affected her for the rest of her life where she became very paranoid and scared and uh, rightly so. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's a quote of hers in the, in the film where she says, you know, they're, they're trying to kill me. And she she said that multiple times, kind of throughout her life post Watergate break in. She said also a few times that um, they tried to have her committed. Do you think that was true as well? You know, it, it, it it's unclear. It doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, she certainly spent some time at this. Um, what I would consider more of a dry out facility in um, called the Craig house. And it's unclear if her husband made her go or if she went voluntarily. But I think that because she had spent time there or she had been sent there in the, you know, at least once in the past that there, that there was always that looming threat, like these men are going to commit me and they're, and they're doing that not to help me, but to silence me. So this is sort of a, a conspiracy theory question. Um, uh, people love to have, you know, these theories about Watergate break-in. Um, the <laughs> the break-in seems particularly badly planned. Um, particularly the fact that, you know, it was in John Mitchell's own apartment building and involved one of his main security guards, uh, James McCord. Did you ever think that that was by design or that was just an assemblage of people who just had no idea what they were doing and did a completely bungled job? I think it was a bungled burglary. I mean, that's essentially what John Dean has, has, has expressed to us. I think he said it in the film. Yeah, I mean, they had no idea. In fact, John Dean says, you know, he's, he's skeptical of how much Martha knew because he says no one knew anything. Like no one knew what was going on. So, so yeah, I think it was, um, I think there were some nefarious activities going on behind, uh, you know, without necessarily Nixon's overt approval. And then, there were lots of, of, of crazy ideas floated by uh, G. Gordon Liddy that were, 
you know, theoretically approved or not approved. And I think that's, that's sort of, you know, there were, uh, yeah, that's essentially what happened. Um, so do you think that if Martha had known that sooner that her own husband was involved in it as deeply as he was, that she would have gagged herself over it or, you know, muffled herself from speaking to the press over it or no? That's a great question. I, I actually think she had an idea that he was behind it. And that's perhaps why she was speaking out so much to protect him and sort of point the finger at Nixon so it wasn't so her husband wouldn't be completely the fall guy or the fall guy um but yeah i'm not i'm not sure it's unclear how much she knew about her husband's culpability or not um close to the or in the in the, in the middle of the film there's a quote from from bob Wood, bob woodward i think saying watergate was much more than a break in it was, and, and I'm uh, not using the direct quote here, but it was a conspiracy to steal an election and it worked. Do you believe that um, Nixon's re-election was stolen, a stolen election? I think Bob Woodward was right in his quote, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, Watergate was such a huge scandal and they had actually tried to break into the Watergate before the actual break in on June 17th. Um, so it was a series of scandalous events that had happened and, you know, dirty tricks that they wanted to do to try and undermine the other candidates. Um, and a lot of it did work. Um, you know, Ed uh, Muskie um, was totally discredited and he was the front runner for the Democrats at the time and a strong candidate. Um, so, yeah, it was a threat to democracy in a way that was very serious. That seems quaint to us now in terms of the threats that we've been seeing for the past several years. Um, but it was absolutely a compromised election. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would just add that you know, John Dean told us this funny story of how <laughs> they, they uh, men who were, you know, on the campaign tour would put their shoes outside of their doors to get them polished. And so they, so somebody from the committee um, stole Muskie's shoes and all of his you know, compadres. And so then they didn't have shoes. They couldn't go to the next stop because they only traveled with one pair of shoes. So that was the kind of, you know, nefarious kind of kooky stuff that they would do. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really amazing story. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this film, the story of Martha, I think, really illustrates uh, in such a great way, but also in such a sad way uh, about women's position in society at, at this time period. Was that part of what attracted you to do the project? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Anne and I had thought about like, do we know any cabinet members' wives' name today? Um, you know, it's really, women really did take a back seat then, um, but they still kind of take a back seat now in some ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. The fact that she was so popular, actually, you know, she became a celebrity. They say it in, in the tapes, you know, Nixon and Mitchell both acknowledge that she became a celebrity, um, but she didn't, yeah, she, sorry, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. <laughs> um yeah but that's yeah and go ahead yeah I, I mean i would just say the parallels um you know are, are very are sort of uncanny to today right i mean like from hillary clinton all the way to like christine blasey ford um i mean to now and during january 6 cassidy hutchinson so you know people are, these women women who are speaking out are constantly being gas gaslit right so so that was very much in our mind when we were starting the film we saw what was happening we saw what happened with trump vis-a-vis -vis hillary clinton and you know it was uh, uh, around me too when we started this so we knew it was kind of a, a perfect storm of of, of uncanniness <laughs> and kind of, and uncanny valley in terms of what was happening today um so do you want to talk about what happened to 
to Martha at the end. It, it's interesting. There was an interview in there where she said something that indicated to me that she really did have pretty bad PTSD from being attacked by those guards. Um, but can, can you just talk about what uh, Martha's ending was like? Because she actually passed away before some of these guys went to jail for Watergate, right? They, they uh, so, so many of them had been indicted by, by while she was still alive. So she actually did have some vindication at the end of her life. Um, you know, she was alive when Nixon resigned. And so she sort of went on a little bit of a press tour um, to kind of uh, speak her mind again, have people listen to her story. And she was very popular because I think the press sort of realized that she was right, that she she was the first one to point the finger at Nixon and they should have listened to her. So she did have a slight vindication, but then subsequently after that, she came down with um, uh, you know a very serious illness and died um, uh, very prematurely in her mid fifties. So yes, in some ways she didn't get the full vindication she deserved and then was lost to history, so yes. Uh, so the, in the end, um, you know, we have the footage from her funeral that's uh, with that flower arrangement that says Martha was right, which is the best thing. One of the best things I've ever seen in life. Um, do you have any theories about who sent that? Do you think it was Helen Thomas or or somebody like Helen Thomas? Oh, I don't know. I don't think it was Helen Thomas. I'd be very yeah. surprised if it was Helen Thomas. Um, I don't know. It was an admirer. It was someone who really, you know, saw that she was speaking the truth. And yeah, in terms of her story, when we learned that, that this flower arrangement turned up at her funeral, that was just like another piece of the story where it was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that we had never heard this before. Um, such a dramatic ending um, and so poignant, you know, because she did have a lot of popular support in America um, and a lot of people did feel like she was telling the truth and didn't get her due. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know who sent that and I don't know if anyone will ever be able to find out who sent that, but I would be very curious to know. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of clips of like major news outlets covering her and the things that she said seemed to be making fun of her. Did you find a lot of that or was there anybody who sort of took, took what she said actually seriously? Yeah. I mean, that was, um, that was another revelation and watching the archival was how much these, you know, uh, you know, hundred percent male, um, talking head broadcasters would sort of toe the party line of Nixon and and look at her in a very skeptical way. And so they, you know, we sort of use them as proxy for the sort of the mainstream narration and how they, they colluded in a way into the gaslighting. Um, but the there were there were other broadcasters who who didn't um, didn't necessarily support that. I mean, Maury Povich didn't support that. He had he had a um, kind of a seminal political show that was local to DC called Panorama um, that you see at the end of the film, and he supported her. Um, and then and then mostly female journalists um, also came together and supported her. It wasn't just um, Helen Thomas. It was um, uh, you know. Um, Sorry, uh, it wasn't just Helen Thomas, it was Winzola McClendon and others. So um, that, that, the, the interview that you have at the end with, with Helen was a great uh, cap to this where she's you know being asked if she thought that Martha was really crazy and, and, and Helen was like, no, I don't think so at all. And I actually think that she was a visionary and um, do you think that, that Helen, Helen Thomas put herself at risk, uh, defending Martha? And do you think that, that Helen put herself and her credibility at risk to defend Martha? Do you want to take that? I think so. Yeah. That, that interview bite is so interesting to me because she kind of hesitates a little bit 
when she answers the question um, because Martha was a kooky character, you know, she was, um, her personality was quite fun and playful and not serious all the time. Um, but to call her a crazy, to even be asked that question, was she a crazy lady? It's kind of a ridiculous thing for a journalist to do. <laughs> Um, so her hesitation is always very interesting to me in, in that interview. And I think she did put her, herself on the line to defend Martha. Um, it obviously probably wasn't a very popular thing to do. So she did put her credibility on the line, but she really did believe her. And she did really think that she was visionary and prophetic as she had said in that interview. So, I mean, I think, I think Helen Thomas was smart enough to, to realize that, yeah, maybe there was some risk in supporting Martha Mitchell, but she had this amazing source source of Martha Mitchell. She was the only one who would speak from the Nixon administration. So she would take her 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. calls because she knew she would get dirt. And so it was a very transactional relationship. I mean, Martha relied upon her and other female journalists to, you know, for friendship and support, but to get the word out. And, you know, Helen Thomas relied upon her as this great source. I mean, even Bob Woodward acknowledged us. He was like, I was, I'm still jealous of Helen Thomas that she scooped me from speaking to Martha Mitchell <laughs> right after the, the break-in. Like he was still talking about it to this day. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering just to, to close out what, for each of you, what do you hope that the takeaway from this short is when people watch it? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I can start. Um, you know, I think, listen, I, I, I hope that people are entertained, that they learn about this hidden figure um, of, you know, this big political scandal of the last century. Um, I also feel like her story, you know, is a reminder um, that there are personal costs to speaking truth to power. Um, but also that 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 soft power is vital, that it's really important and can be very impactful that we, you know, that we need to listen to these overlooked voices or people we might at first deem inconsequential. Um, you know, what might have happened had people listened to her clarion call earlier? Like what what you know, what um, what would we have salvaged, you know, about our democracy? I'm not sure if that's anything, but I, I do think it's important to, to sort of question all that. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Also that there are hidden histories. Um, there are many layers to some of these stories and you can't just believe the, the common narrative that's always told necessarily. Um, like I said earlier, this has always been all the president's men's story and he was this amazing woman um, who had a really important story um, that hopefully, you know, people are learning through our film. Um, so, Definitely, that's a huge takeaway. And also that, you know, speaking truth to power is so incredibly important and to do it within the group that originally like accepted you and you belong to and speaking truth to power to them is a very courageous and brave thing to do. And it's the right thing to do. And Martha knew that and she took the risk to do the right thing. And hopefully our film would inspire some people to do the right thing. All right, well, thank you so much to the two of you for coming to talk about your film. Uh, I enjoyed it so, so much, and um, good luck to you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much, Jen.